I'm actually really excited about this program. This is, you guys are, are really the first time you're, I'm ever going to run through my Quick Start program. But I've had so many people ask me, how do I get started with Small Flash? How do I fill in the gaps between understanding how to use natural light and how to craft light with electronic flash? So for the next two hours, we're going to race through what I consider to be the most important concepts. Now this is a quick start. It's not an in-depth. In fact, I looked at how much information we're going to go through. I thought, holy cow, this is really going to be a sprint. The good news is, you've all, everybody got a booklet? Take home? OK. So this is the new uh, quick start guide that will literally accompany, in most parts, our presentation. So without further ado, and I, uh, let's get started with a big shout out to Canon. Um, this is a Canon-sponsored event, and I'm always grateful when Canon has me stand up in front of a crowd of folks and gives me the resources to get here and spend some time with you. So for those of you who are interested in the work that I do but not necessarily familiar with it, my web presence is Cillerina.com is where you'll find my portfolio of images. I blog in a couple of places, but my fundamental blog, my main blog is Pixelated.com. And then if you are in the Twitter sphere, it's Sill underscore Arena. I love Twitter. Um, 140 characters, that's about my attention span these days. So I consider you know, all my tweets to be uh, complete blog posts these days. I'm really fortunate to be able to say that I've published not only one book, but a couple of books. So there's Speedlighter's Handbook, which came out two years ago. And it really is still the reference book on Canon speed lighting techniques. So if you're a Canonista and you're looking for more buttons and dials info than you'll find anywhere else, Speedlighter's Handbook is still an incredibly relevant book, despite the fact that we have a new generation of Canon Flash, the so 600EX, which has the built-in radio system. That's not covered in the book. Um, and if you're looking for a fundamental stepping stone, Lighting for Digital Photography was published by Peach Pit Press last October. And so these are two complementary books. Lighting for Digital Photography is really a broad look at how do we look at light? Why does light change? You're going to get some of the tidbits of that info in the presentation this afternoon. But those are two resources. Here's Pixelated. If you've got gear questions in the future, what I would encourage you to do is head to Pixelated, click on the gear tab. And for instance, this is a section on how to choose a speed light. And so this is where I've collected various things that I've blogged in the past. Sometimes it's hard to find a specific blog post. So I take the kind of best of segments, and I'm compiling them all in those gear pages. It's still very much a work in progress, but you'll find uh, quite a bit of info. And then you've got the sing-along book, the hymnal today. Okay, <laughs> So this is, in fact, the presentation. Um, that uh, we're going to follow. All right, so number one, why does off-camera flash matter? How many of you are familiar with off-camera flash? OK. And how many of you in the audience, and everybody's got to vote one way or the other, OK? And how many of you say, you know, I really don't understand what the big deal is about off-camera flash. I've got a pop-up flash. Why is that not good enough? Come on, be honest. OK, thanks for being here. Thanks for being brave. Here's why off-camera flash matters. On-camera flash kills or fills shadows. All right, On-camera flash, at best, is going to fill shadows outdoors in bright ambient light. And at its worst, it's going to kill the shadows. Why are shadows important? Because really, it's the shadows that allow the camera to record shape and depth and texture in your photograph. So when you move your light source away from the top of your lens, when you move your flash off camera, you're effectively throwing light at an angle across your subject. So now the camera can see shadows. Now the camera can record. So I'm going to jump back really quick. Look at the photo of Mallory with on-camera flash. Look at her blouse. There's really no texture to that blouse. All right? And look at how much shape and depth and texture there is. OK? So that's why off-camera flash matters. It's because of the shadows that we're creating. OK? All right, number two, for those of you Canonistas who don't know this, you should discover how to control your speed light from the LCD of your camera. All right, You can control every function of your Canon speed light, provided you meet a couple of conditions. We'll go through those in just a minute. But most folks these days were five years, six years past when the 
technology was introduced to us, so most folks these days are shooting compatible gear. You can, on the back of your camera, find all of the functions in your speed light. Now, I'm a little bit older than most people think, and my eyes aren't certainly as good as they were when I was young. And I really appreciate the fact that I don't have to find my reading glasses because I can see these things in the language of my choice. There are 14 or 15 languages programmed into our cameras. So if you speak Spanish better than English, turn your camera on to Spanish and you're going to get that speed light menu in a language you understand. Okay? Now, a couple of distinction points. This technology was introduced in 2007 and all the cameras from 2000, basically the 40D on through the 2011 models are going to present the speed light menu as a text menu. All right? The 2012 cameras, the five 2012 cameras, the 1DX, the 5D Mark III, the 60D, the T4i, and the M. I think that's it. We'll get a chance to check my recollection in just a moment. Um, those cameras actually have a graphical kind of a quick view screen. And one of the cool things about the T4i and the EOS M, the new mirrorless camera, is those two cameras have touch screens. I was shooting the EOS M yesterday up in Central Park. It is so incredible. It's like having an iPhone experience on the back of your Canon camera. All right, so you can actually, instead of having to push buttons and turn dials, you keep tapping on your screen and you are changing settings faster than you ever have before. So here we go. Ah, it wasn't the 60D, it was the 60. So those 2012 cameras, the 1DX, are the, I'm reading off the ones in the green, the 5D Mark III, the 6D, the EOS M, and the T4i. Those are the ones that have the graphical user interface. All the other cameras you see listed on the left side of the screen will present that text-based menu. So if you've got a 20D or a 30D, sorry, that's not going to work because that's pre-2007 technology. On the right side of the screen, we have all of the speed lights that have the ability to display their menu. For me, this is such an easy way to control my gear. That's why I'm slowing down right here and making sure you realize if you've got the compatible gear, you need to find it. Now let me show you how to find it. What you're going to do on most models, except for the 5D Mark II, is you're going to go to the Camera One menu. And if your camera has a pop-up flash, you'll see it says Flash Control. And if your camera doesn't have a pop-up flash, it'll say external speed light control. So you take a Canon speed light, and you put it in your hot shoe, and you turn it on, and you head to that menu, and all of a sudden you're going to find, like we see on the right-hand side of the screen, a whole bunch of menu options, and you scroll down to flash function settings. All right? Now, to make it easy, what I prefer to do is to register that external speed light control over to my menu. That's the area where you can pick five camera functions over on the right hand side of your screen and it's number one in my life, no surprise, okay? So external speed light control is right there. If you're working on one of those text-based cameras, you're gonna say, well, it's kind of silly because every time I click the shutter button, I'm now back at the top of the menu system. I promise you, literally, you do it a couple hundred times your brain will be able to do it faster than you can think it. It is the way to control Canon speed lights. All right? So, number three, and we'll pause for questions, but stick with me. Number three, I want you to consider ambient light first. All right? Most people who work with flash think, oh, somehow this flash is going to understand what my vision as a photographer is. They're going to say, it's going to know how to make that Hollywood picture. I'm just going to put it in the hot shoe and turn it in full automatic. All right? I want you to stop and say, wait a minute. Before I even turn on my flash, I want you to think about the ambient light. Now, ambient light is the light that's already there in the scene. In this room, we've got these lovely LEDs on me. We've got the store lights coming in through the window. Ambient light is everywhere. All right? So always look at the ambient light and think about what's going on. The difference between these two photographs, the one on the left of my son, Vin, is just strictly natural ambient light, sunlight. The image on the right is 
ambient light that's been dimmed by using a faster shutter speed. And look how it saturates the sky. That drama is already there in the clouds. But the camera's programming says, I got to make a picture of the person in front of me. That's what's more important in the metering. So I step in as a creative photographer and say, I'm going to override your metering. I'm going to underexpose the ambient. And then I'm going to bring light back onto my subject. Okay. So the difference between the boring photo on the left and the dramatic portrait on the right is largely the fact that I underexposed the ambient light with my shutter. And I added light back on to my subject with my off-camera speed light. Now, I wish I had been around when I was learning this stuff. Think about that for a moment, OK? Because here's a great secret that somehow flew over my head for years and years and years. Shutter speed is the camera control that you use to adjust the ambient light in your photograph. All right? Shutter speed is the gateway. Here's why you can change the shutter speed on your camera, and it's not going to mess around with your flash. When your speed light is at full power, it's at 1 800th of a second of flash duration. You turn it to half power, it's like a 1200th of a second. You turn it all the way down to 128th power, it's on for about a 6,000th of a second. So the longest your speed light flashes, is an 800th of a second, which is the yellow line we see on both sides of the screen. Now, on the left side of the screen, that wide black gap at the bottom, and I, I got out my ruler and I measured this perfectly, that's a 60th of a second of a gap in time. All right? On the right side of the screen, a 250th of a second. That is the sync speed that most of your cameras have. So look at that. It doesn't matter whether it's a 250th of a second or a 60th of a second, that flash fits through there just fine. You can change your shutter speed up to the sync speed of your camera, and we'll talk about sync speed in a moment. You can change your shutter speed on your camera up to the shutter speed of your, the sync speed and control the ambient light independently of the flash. So I live in California. I live in a little town called Paso Robles, halfway between LA and San Francisco. And we live in a sun-drenched part of the world. So I am routinely using my flash outdoors and bright sunlight as fill light. But I'm always thinking, what do I want this ambient light to do? If I want you, the viewer, to look at my subject, then probably I want to subdue the ambient light. What happens, though, on a cloudy day? And we want to create a nice, bright, ethereal image. We can go the other way. We can take our shutter speed and extend it out. Maybe the camera meters it at 125th of a second. You say, you know what? I need that background to be brighter. I'm going to slow my shutter speed down to a 30th of a second. OK? All right. Now, mixing flash. If you're not shy, there's a couple of spots right up here in the front row, sir. If you want to come on up. You're welcome to do so. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Did you get a book? Yes. Good. Welcome. All right. Now, so we're going to think about the ambient light first. We're going to think about using the shutter as a way to dial the ambient light up or down. All right? Now, the other thing I want you to think about is how your flash blends in with the ambient light. All right, so quick lesson. This is right out of my book, Lighting for Digital Photography. We all know intuitively that sunlight changes throughout the day. At dawn and at sunset, that sunlight has a very warm cast to it. Filmmakers, cinematographers call that the golden hour. Landscape photographers call that the golden hour. All right, that period of the day, beginning and end, when that sunlight is really beautiful and gold. Now, there's actually a period before and after golden hour, before in the morning, after in the evening, when the sun is coming towards the horizon, but it's not quite above, and the sunlight actually bounces off the upper atmosphere. Think about it. You can see the ground before the sun hits the horizon, right? Where's that light coming from? That light is sunlight that's bouncing off the upper level of the atmosphere and coming down. And it has actually an incredibly blue cast to it. 
So oftentimes we don't think about the fact that the color of sunlight changes throughout the day. So this is a little chapel east of my hometown of Paso Robles, California. Shot this last June, so day length is really long. This is late afternoon sunlight, okay? Then a half an hour later or so, as the sun gets closer to the horizon, look at how the temperature changes, the color temperature changes. My camera was locked down in a tripod. The white balance was locked to daylight, so the difference you see in these images is the change in the color of the sun. So this is golden hour light. And now this is blue hour light. In fact, this image on the screen now was made 40 minutes after sunset, which is why it's a 20 second exposure, all right? But that detail aside, what I really want you to think about, again, is that the color of sunlight itself changes throughout the day in a very rhythmic pattern. We know that it's going to start out as blue hour and then golden hour and then this vast period during the middle of the day when the sunlight has a neutral color and then back into golden hour and back into blue hour and then finally into dark of night. Okay? Why does this matter with flash? We're here talking about flash still, not about golden hour. Well, let me tell you this. Your speed light the tube in your speed light and all electronic flash produces the color of light that we see at noon. Very neutral sunlight. Not warm, not cool. So what happens in a situation like this? I'm out at sunset. I want to make a quick snapshot of my friend Mallory. And of course, being the speed lighter that I am, I take the first one with the sun way off towards the horizon. How do you tell that the sun is about to go below the horizon? What's the clue in that photograph? Look at the nail shadow on the telephone pole. It's horizontal. All right, Shadows are always going to point to the light source. So we have just a couple of minutes at most before the golden hour is done. I make that photograph on the left. It's like, oh, you know, beautiful Nallery needs a little bit of fill light. And so boom, I put my flash over there and I fire. Right? And I come up with the image on the right side of the screen. Wrong. All right? This is the image that I get when I put my flash and I fire it at Mallory at golden hour. That is ungelled flash. So there's the disconnect. This is why I want you to think about ambient light first. Because your speed lights put out the color of noontime sunlight. Now, how did I get the shot on the right? How did I blend that fill flash in very seamlessly? Okay, really easy. I used a gel, specifically a CTO gel, a color temperature orange gel. And for those of you who hate taking notes, you can follow right along in the books because all these photos, or most of them, are in those books, all right? Okay, so a color temperature orange gel is what I used. And that's all it took to take the noontime sunlight and turn it into California golden hour setting sunlight. OK? All right. So there's the two shots. Now, let's think about it indoors. We live now in a world that's dominated by compact fluorescent lights. Slowly, it's going to change. Congress legislated those into existence. And Congress, because of the mercury in CFLs, is going to legislate them out of existence when LED lights become cost effective. But right now, much of the light in our everyday world, around our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, comes from fluorescent light tubes. Now, the good thing about fluorescent lights becoming the dominant light source in our world through the CFL is that rather than having that ugly orange or green cast they had when I was a kid, they are to a large degree either balanced for daylight or they're balanced to work with incandescent or tungsten light bulbs. So what we see up on the screen here are three different compact fluorescent lamps. One said, I'm balanced for daylight, and that's, yeah, sort of a neutral gray. The one in the center on the package, it just said warm. And it's obvious to my eye, and you'll understand why in just another slide. It's obvious to my eye that that warm indication really says, I'm intended to work with incandescent or tungsten light bulbs. 
And then the one on the right said, cool. Now that's kind of that old school green cast that we expected out of fluorescent tubes. At least when I was going to grade school, we definitely, supermarkets and classrooms kind of had this crazy green color to them. So there's three tungsten bulbs. I'm going to flip back, look at the CFL in the middle, that warm CFL. Okay, It is very close to the color of light being produced by these three different incandescent light bulbs. Okay, Now, what do we do when we find ourselves in an environment that's lit with tungsten light? Okay, I just showed you an example of how I used a speed light outdoors at sunset to create fill flash and there was a disconnect between that speed light and the setting sun because it looked very cool, very blue on Mallory's skin. Now here's another shot where I've basically used my shutter speed to control how dim the background light is, the ambient light, and then I brought an off-camera speed light onto my subject. I had my, one of my sons, Tom, holding a speed light on a pole a little bit to the side of me. And he fired that light okay, onto this host at a wine reception in Paso Robles. Now, because he's lit with the neutral light from the flash, and I've got my camera's white balance set to daylight, you can also use flash. There's only a small difference between the two. All right, He looks neutrally lit. He looks fine. And we don't really care about the fact that the background is really warm. We are willing to accept warm light. Is that candle light? I mean, if you have a dimmer switch on old school light bulbs, we're all used to the idea that they turn warm and romantic. It's Valentine's Day, OK? So we're going to accept that even more so. So outdoors, because Mallory was lit with the sun, there was that disconnect with the bare fill flash. But indoors, Virtually all of the light on my subject is coming from the flash, and I'm just using that tungsten light in the background to show you some details about the environment that this party happened in. Okay? So I want you to think about the ambient light. Think about its color. Think about how you want it to show up, because quite often we're going to use the ambient light to light the background part of our flash photographs, and we're going to use our speed lights to light the foreground, to light the subject of our shots. OK? All right. Now, jobs. It's all about jobs in today's economy. OK? And we've got to think about creating jobs for our speed lights. And here's how I want you to think about what job you're going to give your speed light. If you know what job you want your speed light to do, then you will know generally where you should put it. Or you could look at it from the other direction. Where you choose to put your speed light to a large degree determines what it's going to do for you. All right? So a couple simple terms. A key light. When a photographer or movie maker talks about a key light, we're talking about the main light on the subject. So here's my friend Tom. And on the right, is the shot where I dimmed the background ambient light with a faster shutter speed, and I used my speed light to draw Tom out from that darkened background. So in this case, that speed light is the key light. The image on the left is the natural light image that the camera is programmed to make. And I think you'll agree there's no distinction, no, or rather, there's strong distinction, just the opposite of what I said, there's a strong distinction between the two images image on the right, you know exactly where you're supposed to look. You're going to concentrate on Tom. And I've left you a few clues in the background. All right? So in this case, I'm using my speed light as the key light on my subject. And I'm using the shutter to dim the background light. Not to blacken it out, but to give you, the viewer, a very clear path to concentrate on Tom. When you look at the image on the left, it's really hard to say, well, am I supposed to look at all these saddles and bridles and horse collar things? Or am I supposed to look at the cowboy in the middle? All right, image on the right. Now, fill light. Fill light. Fill light is so important in my part of the world because I live, again, in that sun-drenched central coast of California. Now, I've been to New York enough. I know the sun comes out here almost as often as it does, except in the winter, it seems. 
our cameras cannot record the full range of brights and darks that we can see. So when you find yourself in really bright ambient light situations, when you find yourself outdoors at noon, all right, you need to think about the fact that the camera is not going to be able to record the full range of brights and darks that you can see. The shot on the left, sunlight only. All right? Now, if I ever wanted to be a hubcap photographer, this would not be the start of my portfolio because there's a handsome photographer in that image if you look closely. But what I really want you to look at is not my reflection in the fender or in the bumper, but how the tire tread merges with the asphalt and you can't see any texture. You can't see the name on the side of the tire. This is the shot that our cameras are programmed to make outdoors in full sunlight. They prioritize for those highlight details and the shadow details are lost. So on the right side, I used two speed lights. Let me show you that set shot. I used two speed lights. The one in the back is on a cord connected to the hot shoe of my camera, and I'm controlling it from the menu on my camera's LCD. It's the master speed light. It's sending instructions to the one that I'm holding in my hand. I don't work with an assistant, so in this case, I was both light stand and camera operator by stretching myself out and pushing the shutter button and holding that speed light in place. So in this case, my flashes are creating fill light I'm throwing light into the shadowy areas of the image so that the camera can record those details. I could see, with my own little eyes, I could see the tread, I could see the texture, I could see the name on the sidewalls, but the camera couldn't record it. So fill light. Think about using fill light when the ambient light is really, really bright. In fact, most photographers, when the sun is out, they think, I don't need flash. That's the time you should turn your flash on. Put it in the hot shoe. Turn your speed light to ETTL. What's ETTL? We'll talk about it in just a few frames. All right. Classic three light portrait. All right. So first frame on the left, that's three speed lights working together. We've got a key light, main light on the subject. We've got a fill light. And then we've got what's called a hair light coming from behind. OK? So what we're thinking about right now is just what kinds of jobs can you give your speed lights? I want you to think about three basic jobs as I hold up four fingers. I've always done that. All right? So key light, fill light, hair light, OK? You don't have to have three speed lights to have a hair light. You can say, hey, you know what? I just, I've got a dark subject against a dark background. I want to create a separation line along the edge of my subject. Maybe they're perfectly lit, but they're wearing a black shirt against a dark background. So let's take a look. There we go. There's the set shot. OK? There's the set shot. So you've got a key light and a fill light, and then that hair light, OK? Now, this is going to be a segue into where we're going next in terms of where we position our speed lights. If you know what you want your speed light to do, then you're going to say, ah, OK. Now I've got some ideas as to where to put it. So just as a quick reminder, Paso Robles is horse country and wine country, so we got a lot of wine drinking cowboys to photograph. On camera flash on the left, my friend Jamie, this is a 430 EX speed light in the hot shoe of my camera. And then for the image on the right, I moved it off camera about six feet came at Jamie from like a 45 degree angle, and you see that shape and that depth and that texture, particularly of a shirt, OK? So again, thinking about what I want my speed light to do, in this case, I want it to be the key light, the main light on Jamie, all right? So we're going to walk our way around what I call the lighting compass. I'm an old Boy Scout, and I'm a Boy Scout leader, OK? So I always think about compasses. The red speed light at the bottom of the compass, your hot shoe, a speed light in the hot shoe of your camera, is a great place to put a speed light if you want fill light outdoors and bright sunlight. It's a really lousy place to put a speed light if you want it as your key light. Okay? So in the case of Jamie on the left, 
speed light in a hot shoe, as the key light flattens the image, it's killing the shadows. It's not even filling them. When you go beyond a nice fill, you're killing the shadows. All right? So, fill light, perfect outdoors, bright sunlight. In the hot shoe flash, great. OK? That's about the only time that I'm going to use my speed light in the hot shoe. I'm going to show you some bounce techniques in a few frames, all right? So if you say, I got to create soft light, I'm moving in a situation, an event that's so fast, I've got to have my speed light in the hot shoe, I'll show you some techniques, OK? But we're not taking that hot shoe flash and going to fire it straight at our subject. That's on camera flash. So we'll table that thought of how do we get good light from the hot shoe as a key light for just a few more frames. All right, now, the green speed lights, about 45 degrees, OK? So kind of halfway between where I'm standing and somewhere to the side of my subject. That's a really good place if you're starting out with off-camera flash. That zone is a really good zone to put your speed light. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter if you go right or left. Okay? It's not like right light is good and left light is bad. It may depend upon what's in the background. Okay? But that's a good zone. Now notice it says key or fill for those green speed lights. We can use two speed lights in a studio or in a dark space, and I can have one really bright and one slightly dimmer to be key and fill. I don't have to always have just one speed light firing. All right? We'll talk about the fundamentals of the built-in flash system. So key or fill, those green speed lights, great place to start with. Now, if you move around your subject in a circle with your lights, 90 degrees to the right, 90 degrees to the left, that's a really aggressive place to have a key light. You're going to create basically silhouette kind of lighting, it's incredibly dramatic. But again, think about what job you want your speed light to do. If you're trying to create beauty light, chances are you're not going to put, want to put your key light right there at 90 degrees. But if you want drama, that's a great place for it. So again, that 90 degrees right or left, great spot for a key light or for a fill light. There's so many different combinations. You could have a fill light coming in, or a key light coming in at an angle, and a fill light coming in on that other side, and create beautiful light. Now, look at the three speed lights behind our subject, the blue ones. Those, for the most part, are either rim lights or hair lights. Those are the lights coming from behind that are going to create an edge of brightness around, and in my case, like a halo of frizz. OK, when that light comes straight in from behind. So if I want to separate my subject from a dark background, or if I need to reveal the texture or the color, the detail of my subject's hair, then I can put a speed light high and behind and angle it down, literally for the purpose of creating a rim of light on the shoulders and to show hair detail, particularly if your subjects have dark hair. OK? So if you think about what job you want your speed light to do, you're going to have a really good idea of what zone you should start putting it in. OK? Are there ways to break all of these rules? Of course. Of course. But these are good fundamental points in terms of where you can position your speed light. So here's my friend Mallory again. And just kind of a quick reveal on camera flash down there on the left. And then as we move the speed light in a circle around Mallory, you can see how that light changes. So for instance, in the upper right hand corner of the screen, there's a speed light coming in right from her shoulder. Now could you say, oh yeah, that's a dramatic place to have a key light? Yeah, sort of. But without any fill on her face, that photograph is lost by itself. But that could be a perfectly good place to have a fill light to supplement key light coming from the front. And then you see, for instance, up there, a hair light or a rim light can do such, I mean, there's nothing to it other than that edge of light that it's putting on all right, around Mallory, which, again, the purpose of that, to separate your subject from a dark background. 
OK. I always pause before we get into this section. How many of you feel confused about which camera setting you want to change from time to time? Raise your hands, everyone. You're all liars if your hands aren't up, in my opinion, OK? <laughs> I get confused. Oh, what's, what, you know, shutter, aperture, ISO, what do I want to change? On and on and on. All right. Here's how I think about it. I use my aperture to control my depth of field. It does other things. You will hear flash photography taught by others, and they'll say, oh, change your aperture to brighten or dim your flash. Well, if you change your aperture to do that with your flash, it's also going to change the depth of field in your shot. So the way Syl thinks about it is, I use my aperture to control the depth of field in my shot. Okay. If I need shallow depth of field, or I need as much depth of field as I can get. Now, quick sidebar. I generally think about apertures like this. I've got a really wide one, f2.8 or f4, depending on what lens I'm shooting. I've got something in the middle, let's just call it f8. And I've got the really tiny one at the other end of the aperture setting. I don't worry about all the other little click stops in between. Can I see? The difference between the depth of field at 7.1 and f8? No. Not unless I'm making billboards and not unless I'm working in a studio in a critical environment. So for me, it's the wide aperture, something in the middle, either f8, f11, and then in those rare instances where I'm trying to grab as much depth of field as I can, f16, 22, 32, depending on what lens I'm at. Shutter speed. Now, I've talked about the fact that you can use your shutter to dial ambient up or down in your images. In a sun-drenched part of the world, I routinely use faster shutter speeds than my camera thinks I should, based on its metering, so that I can dim the ambient light. But there's another thing that you can use your shutter for. You can emphasize motion, or you can freeze motion. Okay. So let's think about that. If you're saying, which camera setting do I change? And these all, believe it or not, tie into flash photography. But if your goal is to use a shutter speed that's fast enough to freeze a high jumper, for instance, jumping over a bar, or to freeze water hitting your son's hand, then that is going to be the first thing that I set. And I'll have to take an aperture that works with that, or I'll have to use my ISO to adjust it. On the other hand, if I want to emphasize motion, then I've got to use a longer shutter speed. So all of these things relate to each other. So in your booklet, page 8, I think it is. Yep, page 8. These are kind of all the either or decisions you can go through. All right? We're not going to go deep into it, but I want to point it out to you. Aperture, deeper, shallow depth of field. All right. I limit, again, my aperture choices to the depth of field I want. Shutter. Sometimes I've got to use a fast shutter speed to enable hand holding the camera if I don't have an image stabilized lens. All right. Certainly, I use my shutter to dim the ambient a lot. Sometimes I use a longer shutter to lift the ambient. ISO. For me, all right. ISO is the setting I change to keep my shutter and my aperture in my desired range. And I'm an old film guy. I'm an old film guy. And it took me many years of digital photography to realize it's OK to change the ISO from frame to frame to frame. So all of you folks who are starting out in digital and thinking back to film where you would put in a 36 exposure roll of Tri-X, and you wouldn't change your ISO or way back in the day, the ASA setting on your camera midway through that roll. There's a seat right here if you're, okay. all right? So ISO for me is a setting, I have to remind myself, still, so it's OK to change the ISO. And I change my ISO so that I can keep my shutter speed and my aperture where I want them. And the good news is, Every generation of camera that comes out has better noise sensitivity than the previous generations, all right? 
Then down at the bottom, we've got several notations for flash power. We're going to move on because we're going to talk about flash power in a bit. Now, I want you all to think about the word stop. And this is how I want you to connect all of the exposure settings on your camera. Because if your camera looks at my friend Jamie standing in a tack room and it says, oh yeah, you've got to shoot this at 125th at your chosen f8. And I say, well, wait a minute, I want to dim the background. I need to think, all right, what am I going to do with my shutter speed, the 125th of a second? OK. Maybe I want to dim it by two stops. Well, OK. So there's all of these relationships, interrelated relationships between shutter and aperture and ISO and flash power. But none of the numbers are the same. It's like we've got fractions for shutter speeds, these F numbers for apertures. Mercifully, with ISO, they're just nice kind of multiples of 100. But then flash power, depending upon how your camera's set up, maybe it's fractions or maybe it's decimals. So here's what I want you to do, all right? I want you to think about every one of these settings, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, flash power, and their relationship to each other in terms of stops. Now, what's a stop? A stop is when you take any of those four settings and you either double it or you cut it in half. Old school photographers will remember that our lenses had rings around them that actually had detents with the <laughs> aperture numbers. And so we would change from f5.6 to f8 to 11, and maybe there was a half stop in the middle. So we're kind of borrowing that term. If you're a Nikonian, you may be familiar with the term EV, exposure value. A stop or an EV are basically the exact same concept. So if I'm changing something by one EV, that tells me that I'm either doubling it or I'm having it. The fact that I changed it by a stop, if that's all you know, I say, oh yeah, I changed my shutter by a stop. That doesn't tell you which direction I headed, right? So you've got, if you're, if you're like going to a workshop, you're shooting with friends, and they say, oh, yeah, I changed it by a stop. Well, OK. Which direction did you head? Are we heading uptown or downtown on the subway here? That's a big issue for me in this town. <laughs> All right. So minus one stop move. If I've got the crown setting on my camera and I want to take a stop out, I now have my crown setting to 1 half. Or if I want to change an increase from one crown to two crowns, that's a plus stop. All right, so we've got to think about which direction we're heading, up or down. So pop quiz, if I go from one crown on my camera setting to four crowns, how many stops did I change? Is that a four stop change? It's a two stop change, and here's why. I go from one crown on my camera to two crowns, that's a one stop change. I then have to double the two. I don't add one more to it. I'm doubling or halving every time. So I go from two crowns to four crowns. That's a two-stop move. So if you've ever read in the manual, photo books, whatever, oh yeah, you know these ratio things that Canon uses with their flash, and you've got eight times the power of light, that's really only a you know, one to eight ratio. That's saying, OK, the B side is three stops brighter than the A side. And it's hard to connect these things so that all of a sudden we've got this concept of a stop as the decoder ring so we can say, what do we do? Now, in your booklets, you've got this chart. All right, These are all the whole stop increments. In the first column, it's shutter speed. In the second column, aperture. Third column, ISO. Fourth column, flash power. Big values at the top of the chart, small values at the bottom of the chart. You compare the numbers in your viewfinder to this chart, you go, wait a minute, there's a whole lot of numbers in my camera that are not on this chart. And that's absolutely true. Depending on how you have your camera and your flash set up, you're going to have either half stop increments or one third stop increments. You're going to look at your viewfinder, and it's going to say f4, and then it's going to say 4.5. And then it's going to say 5. And then it's going to say 5.6. All right? And then it's going to say, I think it's going to say 8 and 9 and 11. Forget all those numbers in between. Forget all those other numbers. 
the one-third stop increments don't make that big a difference. All right? Most often, people aren't making big enough changes. Think, well, I changed it three clicks. That's got to be a lot. Whatever that is, I don't know. It was three clicks. That seemed like a lot to me. Three clicks most likely is a one-stop change. And if you really want to take the drama out of the ambient light in the background, you might need to change your shutter speed two stops or three stops. Now, most of us are familiar with that concept of equivalent exposures. So you can use this chart for equivalent exposure calculations. You can say, for instance, if I'm at 125th and at f8, and I want shallow depth of field, so let's just do it on the fly. I'm going to go to 2.8. So looking at the chart, you'll see if you go from f8 to 5.6 to 4 to 2.8, that's three stops. Okay. So where did I say my shutter was? 125th, I think. All right. So we've got to go from 125th now to make a reciprocal move to 50, 500, a thousandth of a second. So a thousandth of a second at f2.8 is the same as 125th at f8. So you can use a chart for those equivalent exposures. But I often use this chart to say, all right, I want to dim the ambient with my shutter two stops. If my shutter speed is a 30th of a second, what do I have to do? Oh, OK, 30th to a 15th, 15th to an eighth of a second. Wait a minute, I can't hold an eighth of a second. OK, what camera setting can I change that will allow me to shoot at like a 30th of a second, which I can handhold most days if I'm adequately caffeinated? All right. Not too much, not too little. Yeah, All right. What camera setting can I change to get that shutter speed back up to a 30th of a second that's not going to affect my depth of field? ISO. ISO. There we go. Gold stars for everyone. Right? So now all of a sudden I can use this chart and say, well, wait a minute. I two stops down on my shutter to dim the ambient, but I can't hold an eighth of a second by hand. I don't have my tripod. Ah, my ISO is at 100. So now I can use the chart and say I'm at 100. Let's go one stop to 200, another stop to 400. Okay, So even though I'm thinking flash photography, I want to dim the ambient with my shutter, if that pushes the shutter speed into a range, I can move around up and down on the chart. Okay, There is no relationship on this chart horizontally. These are like independent little levers that you move up and down. Okay, If you want to get serious about your craft as a photographer, memorize these whole stop increments. I'm not a lot about memorizing stuff in the world of photography. But knowing where those whole stop increments are, and you look at the metadata on my images, more often than not, my images are shot at whole stop increments of aperture. Okay, Why? Because I'm not going to see the difference between f7.1 and f9. I'm just going to lock it in at f8. Okay, I'm not going to worry about those one third stop increments. All right. now. Moving on, speed light modes. How many of you guys get confused about which mode you should have your speed light in? Thank you for that hand in the back, very honest man. Everybody else in the middle, you're all liars. Because we all get confused. We all get confused, OK? Should I be in ETTL? Should I be in manual? On and on and on. Here's how I want you to think about it. I want you to think about the distance between the flash and the subjects. If that distance between the flash and the subject is fixed, you're going to use one type of mode. I'll tell you which one in just a moment. If the distance between the flash and the subjects continues to change, you're going to use another mode. That's how I think about which flash mode I'm going to use. Is the distance between the flash and the subject fixed, or is it variable? All right. Notice I didn't say the distance between the camera and the subject. We're here talking about off-camera flash. So more often than not, I've got a speed light on a light stand, and maybe my camera's moving in and out. But guess what? If the distance between the subject and the flash doesn't change, then I don't have to change the flash power. Now, ETTL. When you turn your speed light on, after you put a fresh set of batteries in, it defaults to ETTL, evaluative through the lens metering. ETTL is the flash mode you should use when the subject of flash distance is variable. If you're photographing an event, 
like I'll photograph those wine parties I showed you a shot of earlier. I'll have one of my sons carry speed light on a pole around the party. Sometimes he's standing closer to the guest. Other times he's standing farther away. Sometimes I'm shooting a group. Sometimes I'm shooting solo, a solo person. So that's a dynamic situation where the subject of flash distance changes all the time. So I'm in ETTL mode. Now here's what happens on ETTL. You press the shutter button halfway in your camera. Camera sends a message at the speed light, hey, throw out the pre-flash. The pre-flash is a pulse of light, 1 32nd power. So the camera knows how much light was thrown out. It then looks at how much light comes back in and where it's coming back in from in the viewfinder. And there's some other more complicated thing. I'm painting it in very broad strokes to keep it understandable today. It looks at how much light's coming back where it's coming back from. Oh, and by the way, as you push the shutter button halfway, just before the pre-flash, it took an ambient meter reading. And just for giggles, it takes a second ambient meter reading after it takes that flash meter reading. It does all this literally in the blink of an eye. It evaluates, ETTL, evaluative through the lens. It evaluates all that data, ambient meter reading, flash meter reading, ambient meter reading to come up with a calculation of how much flash power it thinks the speed light should throw out. It then tells the speed light, hey, charge those photon torpedoes to 30 second power. Full spread at 30 second power. OK, get ready, fire. I'm opening the shutters. And we've got ETTL flash, all right? Now, ETTL is incredible technology. Incredible technology. The fact that that literally happens in the blink of an eye continues to amaze me. But here's the maddening part about ETTL. One, speed light and camera never tell us what flash power was used. There's no metadata, and there's no way to write down any metadata, even if you keep a notebook, about what flash power was used. Two, without you moving, your subject moving, or your speed light moving, if you change the zoom on your lens, or you change from maybe a horizontal to a vertical composition, you have just given your camera a different metering pattern. And it may meter the scene differently and throw out more or less light than it just did. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute. All I did was zoom my lens. Well, yeah, but in that first frame, you had it really tight on the bride. And she was wearing a white dress that threw back a lot of light. So the camera just had a low flash power. And then you zoomed wide, and there's the bride and three guys in black holes of tuxedos on either side of her. So now it meters and it says, wait a minute, I just threw out this light, but not much of it came back. The camera has no idea there's three big guys like JC standing in tuxedos next to the little bride, right? You just zoomed wide for that group shot. So now all of a sudden, the speed light throws out all of its photons, and it overexposes everything. You say, well, I don't understand why this happened. All I did was change the zoom. Well, you just fed your camera a different metering target. So this is important to know, because ETTL drives a lot of folks crazy. I think it's an incredibly valuable tool. But we have to know that the camera is smart as they are, and the speed light as fast as it can work. Those machines have no idea what our vision is inside of our head. So there is a setting on your speed light, and in my world, and hopefully in your world, on the back of your camera called flash exposure compensation. And FEC, flash exposure compensation, is the way that you impose your vision as the photographer on the ETTL calculations that your camera's making. As a general rule, you want to add, use a positive FEC adjustment when the subject is bright, like the bride's dress, for instance. And you want to use minus FEC when the subject has very dark tones. People often get confused about which way you go with FEC. Just look at your subject and say, yeah, this guy is wearing a black tux. And the reason that you have subtractive FEC is camera throws out that meter reading at the tux. It doesn't know that it's black. It just knows that not much light came back. So it fires a speed light at high power. And at high power, black tux actually looks kind of like medium gray, like the black and white version of that baby blue thing that was big in the 80s. All right? So you've got to subtract 
a couple of stops. So we've got zero up on the screen. That's where I'm at. And I've dialed in a minus one stop, one, two, and three stop adjustment, plus or minus. OK? Now you can dial kind of a gotcha here that's not up in the slide. You can dial FEC in on your speed light directly. And you can dial it in through your camera. If you have dialed in as any FEC directly on the speed light by turning the dial on the back, it will lock out the FEC adjustment on the camera. You cannot dial FEC in in two places. And if you dial in any adjustment on your speed light, it will lock you out of adjusting it on the camera. That's just the engineer's choice. If there's any number programmed into the speed light, it locks out the camera setting, even the LCD. All right. So I always do it in one place and not another. Now, manual mode, all right? Manual mode is where I frankly spend most of my time as a speed lighter. Manual mode on my camera, where I'm choosing the shutter speed and the aperture. And manual mode on my speed lights, where I'm telling the speed lights what power to fire at. Why is that? I do a lot of location portraits. And in those instances, the person standing there, I'm standing here, my light or lights are on stands. Nobody's moving around. So that subject of flash distance is fixed. When the subject of flash distance is fixed, you should be in manual mode. Why? Because manual mode is consistent from frame to frame to frame. If I get the bride and the groom and a couple of groomsmen all lit the way that I want. And then I have the two groomsmen step out of the frame and I go in tighter on my viewfinder. I don't need to add or subtract any flash. I've already done the hard work. You're shooting a prom and you've got a little piece of tape and you tell all the prom lit couples to come in and stand on that piece of tape. And then they, you know, a couple of frames and they're off, all right? Lights up on stands. I'm absolutely in manual mode. Manual mode is your friend. A lot of folks who don't understand flash think, oh, I'm just going to go ETTL because it's automatic. If you're learning flash photography, work in manual mode. Dial the power up and down because you'll understand, oh, at ISO 1600, at four feet away, 1.8 power will just create a nuclear flash in your frame. It'll all be white with a little bit of kind of silhouette of your friend. That's important experience to have once in a while. And you go, oh, OK, well, what's one stop down? What's a 16th? What's a 32nd? What's a 64th? What's 128? And you go, oh, yeah, that ISO thing. Now, even at minimum power, if you're in manual mode, you own those decisions. And it's such a valuable way to learn. All right? Now, I have to share this with you. Canon's new radio-based speed light system, the 600EX-RT, and the radio transmitter, the STE3RT, have a new flash mode that is fantastic. <coughs> fantastic. But to make this new group mode work, you've got to have the new radio-based speed light system connected to a 2012 camera model. All right, So that's the 1DX, the 5D3, the 6D, the T4i, and the EOS M. And whatever else comes forward. Why do you have to have one of those 2012 or newer cameras? Because the concept of group mode didn't exist until this radio-based speed lighting gear came out. So my 5D Mark II will probably never know about group mode. Now, what's the cool thing about group mode? Well, the cool thing about the new group mode is that for the first time as a Canonista, I've got five different groups, meaning I can have five different speed lights doing different jobs, and I can have them at different power levels. I can run some of those speed lights in ETTL and some of those speed lights in manual. Why would I want to have both ETTL and manual? Well, let's say that I'm photographing a ballerina. She's coming across the stage and leaping. And sometimes she leaps over there, and sometimes she leaps here. Subject to flash distance is variable. So I want to have my flash on her be in ETTL. But the speed lights that are lighting the background are on stands. The background's not moving. So that's a manual situation. So it's nice to be able to mix in an advanced setting, ETTL and manual. All right? But the thing I love most about group mode, in addition to having five groups, is that I can shut individual groups off. When I showed you that three light portrait, and I said, there's the three light, there's the key light, there's the fill light, there's the hair light, 
I, from the back of my camera, said I'm shutting off the key light and the fill light to get just the hair light. I'm shutting off the hair light and the key light to get just the fill light. So by being able to shut individual groups on and off, and again, group mode. So the good news is, going forward, all the Canon cameras are going to know about group mode. It is an amazing, amazing experience. All right, sync speeds and sync modes. All of our cameras have a defined sync speed. And it's important to know what it is on your camera. If you have a full sensor camera that doesn't have 1D in the name, then your sync speed is a 200th of a second. For virtually everyone else, it's a 250th of a second. Now, the mechanics of how your shutter works, and that's the shutter mechanism out of a 7D, I do not encourage you to go find your own, by the way. So don't go digging and tearing your camera apart and say, I want to see what the shutter mechanism looks like. But that's what it looks like. And it's got two curtains in it. And basically what happens is when you press the shutter button, the first curtain is going to fly open. And at a certain point in time, the second curtain is going to close. And the difference between those two movements is your shutter speed. In order to get flash to work, we have to fire the flash after the first curtain is completely cleared, which is what the bottom chart shows. We've got to fire the flash when the first curtain is fully open, but before the second curtain <laughs> begins to move. If the second curtain begins to move, then the whole sensor is not going to see the flash. So at the sync speed of your cameras, that's the last shutter speed where the first curtain gets completely across before the second curtain begins to move, because just above that. So at, say, a 320th of a second, before the first curtain is completely across, the second curtain has begun to move. At an 8,000th of a second, the second curtain leaves the station right after the first curtain. It's just literally a slit flying across. There's no point where we can fire the flash and have the full frame exposed. So even if you're not mechanical and you don't want to know that first curtain, second curtain thing right now, here's what you do now. Here's my friend Diallo outdoors in Santa Fe, 3200th of a second. And I say, you know what? He needs a little bit of fill flash on his face. Ah, cool. I got the hot shoe. I got ETTL. I put the speed light in the hot shoe. I have my camera in manual mode. I own that 3200th of a second shutter speed, right? Wrong. Even when your camera's in manual mode, if you put a Canon speed light in the hot shoe and turn it on, the camera is going to say, wait a minute, I've got a sync speed here. I am programmed. And I will force the shutter speed back to the sync speed for that camera. So many people have said, I tried flash once. It completely blew out the image. I hate flash photography because this is all I get. Well, the reason they get this is that they don't know about sync speed. There's a really simple fix for this problem. All right? The really simple fix is you activate a sync mode called high speed sync. All right? High speed sync changes the way your speed light fires so that you can use faster shutter speed. So look at the shot now of Diallo. There's nice, even light on his face. And I got that 3200th of a second that I wanted. All I had to do was push the high speed sync button on the back of my speed light. All right? Now, here's again in the bottom diagram the illustration of the two curtains, the second curtain beginning to close before the first curtain has begun to open or is fully open. And in high speed sync, what happens is your speed light turns itself on 30,000 times a second. It's like a machine gun of light. And it's turned on before the first curtain moves and after the second curtain closes for that brief period of time. All right? It becomes a continuous light source for a very small period of time. Now, the challenge of using high speed sync is that there is no free lunch, and the cost of turning that speed light on and off so rapidly is basically a two and a half stop power loss. So, to go back to the portrait of Diallo for a moment, that's not a big deal. Fill flash outdoors, bright ambient sunlight, speed light in the hot shoe in ETTL mode. Just make sure you have high speed sync turned on your speed light. That's it. 
really, really simple. Okay? So high speed sync, depending on the speed light you have, we've got basically the 580EX and the 430EX over on the left side of the screen. The new 600EX on the right side of the screen. The 600EX, if you've not experienced it up close, has interactive menu system. The purpose of the buttons changes. Whereas on the previous generations of speed light, the purpose of each of those buttons is hard coded. So you look for that flash bulb H icon that you see on the left hand side of the screen. So your 580s, your 430s, you're going to hit the second button from the right. On your 600, depending upon what mode you're in and so on, more often than not, it's the rightmost button. And what I tell folks who are new to the, the new generation of speed lights, if you don't see what you're looking for in the menu system, because you've got the wireless system turned on, just keep pushing the button that says menu on it, and it will cycle through. Because the labeling in the screen, look how much bigger on the quick sidebar, but look how much bigger the screen is on the 600 compared to the 580EX. Those are, those are side by side comparisons. So turning high speed sync on and off is really, really easy. So think about high speed sync as basically the bright light sync mode you're going to use for fill flash. All right? Now, there's also a mode called second curtain sync. Second curtain sync, I want you to think about as being the dim light sync mode. All right? And what's in between, we don't really call it first curtain sync, but that's what it truly is. So normal sync, first curtain sync. This is an example of what happens when we fire a speed light at a relatively slow shutter speed. So this is an eighth of a second. Camera's locked down on a tripod. My buddy's riding by on his bike. And he and the bush are being lit by the flash. And you see his headlights and taillights burning into the frame. Now, if you're trying to create a shot where he's shooting laser beams, OK, perfect then. <laughs> First curtain sync works, but it doesn't really look natural. Second curtain sync. <coughs> Second curtain sync looks more natural because what happens is the shutter opens, but the flash doesn't fire until just before the second curtain closes, hence its name, second curtain sync. So what's happening here is the headlights and the taillights burn in, but you, and then finally at the end, the flash pops, and you get the background, and you get the bike. Without the flash, all we'd see is a white streak and an orange streak across the frame, and that's it. So second curtain sync, dim ambient light. High speed sync, bright ambient light. They are literally just push buttons on the back. You hit that sync button once, it goes to second curtain sync. You push it again, high speed sync. You push it again, back to normal sync. So it's just a loop. If you miss the station you want to end up at, just push the button a couple more times, you'll get there. All right. Ways to trigger off-camera speed lights. So we're talking about off-camera flash. And I want to give you a quick survey of five basic ways to fire speed lights off-camera. If you are just starting out, I would encourage you to get a coiled ETTL cord. Now notice I said ETTL cord. We're canonistas. An ETTL cord is going to have a foot that matches all of the pin configurations of your speed light. And it's going to have a hot shoe that matches all the contact plates of your camera. All right? There are other types of cords, just regular old PC sync cords that don't have that wiring. If you're an Iconian, then you want to make sure you get an ITTL cord. That's Nikon's brand, intelligent through the lens metering. And they have a different pin <laughs> configuration. All right? The nice thing about a coiled cord is, as you can see, the handsome lad in the lower right hand corner of the frame, pre beard, demonstrating. You can just basically hold your speed light off camera. When I'm working an event solo without one of my sons in attendance, which is always their default position, by the way. I'm busy, Dad, sorry. All right. I'm often running around the event with my speed light on a cord because I've got to photograph a whole bunch of people. But believe me, just two and a half feet. I don't, I don't got a you know a huge reach here, all right? But two and a half feet separation between my lens and my flash is enough to create some depth and texture. It, my images certainly look better than the guy who's running around with the speed light stuck in the hot shoe of his camera. All right, So that's where I would start. 
Now there are long ETTL cords, all right? So I started this little company, OCF Gear, um, a couple years ago, and there are other brands. We're going to get OCF Gear cords into B&H real pronto, um, like hopefully in the next few weeks, maybe the next month or so. But these are 16 and 32 foot cords. And you think, why would you want such a long cord? Well, if you're an event photographer, you absolutely don't want a long cord. But if you're shooting headshots in your garage, you're on location, this is a way to get your speed light off camera, but still use that on-camera menu system. The camera doesn't even know the speed light's not in the hot shoe because you're using that ETTL cord. So one of the things you can see down in the bottom left-hand corner, I'm going to show you a close-up of it, is when we talk about soft boxes, and I'm a big fan of the Apollo soft boxes, you can put three speed lights in there. If you've got three speed lights, or you've got two friends, each with a speed light, and they're letting you borrow it, you put one in as a master on the cord, and the other two speed lights in that soft box are slaves. And you're controlling that whole system from the convenience of the LCD on the back of your camera. So for me, even as a pro, I still carry ETTL cords with me, all right? So short cords, long cords, there's the first two ways. Now another trigger you're going to see out in the market are any range of manual radio triggers. You can get them for as cheap as 25 bucks a set. You can spend 100, 150 bucks. You can even spend $600 for the top of the line Profoto Multimaxes. Now, those Profotos will say exactly the same thing that the $25 ones say. All they say is fire now. They don't say, hey, fire that pre flash. OK, change your flash to this power setting. Do this, do that. They just say fire. Now, the Profotos can do that across a quarter mile. All right. They can do that at the Olympics where there's 600 other photographers standing shoulder to shoulder because you've got private frequency capability. So there's absolutely reasons to have that gear. They can fire cameras and on and on and on. But the key thing to know about all of these manual radio triggers is they have the same vocabulary. They tell the speed light one thing, fire. That's it. You want to change the power? You got to walk over to the speed light. You got three speed lights, you got to walk to each individual speed light. Okay? It can be a cost-effective way. If walking to each speed light is not a problem for you, then $25 trigger set or $50 trigger set could be a perfect solution for you. All right. Now, there are ETTL radio triggers. These are radio triggers that will say, hey, fire that pre-flash. OK, now change your flash power to a 16th. Now get ready to fire. OK, fire. Pocket Wizard's control TL system is used by a lot of photographers. But take a look at that price tag. $160 to $225 per device. You've got to have one in your camera and one attached to each of your speed lights. That's really expensive technology. Okay? I think it's good technology for the right situations. Wedding photographers pre-600EX, wedding photographers were huge consumers of these. Now that we have radio built in, not so much, all right? The system I use, the system I've used for years, is the one that's built into our speed lights. I would encourage all of you, use the system that's built into your Canon speed lights. And I'm going to take you through the fundamentals really quick, all right? I'll take you through those fundamentals to give you the su success you need, but of the five ways to trigger off-camera speed lights. I'm still a user and an advocate of cords. I like the speed and the convenience they provide and the economy they provide when using one speed light. I like the fact that I can put multiple speed lights inside an Apollo softbox, which is a great modifier, and control all of that from the back of my camera. All right, so really quick, this is a short section. A lot of folks say, hey, I don't even know how to connect like an umbrella or a softbox to a light stand. So this is in the booklet. But for me, the key is the Manfrotto 026 swivel adapter. That's the bendy thing in the middle. You got a light stand. Get yourself an eight or nine foot light stand. All right. The Manfrotto 026 is going to cost you 10 bucks more than a plastic job. A plastic swivel adapter is going to break, I promise. I'm going to come really, really close to saying an 026 Manfrotto will never break. I've traveled all over teaching, and I've yet, other than the tip of one of the plastic handles, broke off once. But other than that, these things are rock solid. Now, if you're just starting out, just remember this. 
the umbrella shaft goes above the handle. Because then, when you have your speed light and you're tilting it, the umbrella is going to tilt with the speed light. If you put the umbrella shaft on the bottom, below the handle, then the speed light tilts, but the umbrella stays locked. It's a pretty simple mistake to make because without having that metal spigot in one end, you say, which end's up? Okay. And so the other connection is I've got brass spigots, and then either a cold shoe or those OCF cords have uh, machined aluminum bases that thread right on there. This is also in your workbook. If you don't need to support an umbrella, you can assemble what I call a monoball swivel from three parts. You've got a little, basically what's called a Manfrotto ra rapid riser, an O1438, all right? And you thread a monoball onto that, and then you put a cold shoe on that. So when you turn one knob, and you can move your speed light in any direction. The thing I look most for on a chute is speed and convenience, all right? Because I'm focusing on that relationship with my subject. I don't want to have to, oh yeah, I got to turn this, hold this, now turn that, and then do this to move the light. I just turn one thing, and I've got my light moving. But this doesn't work with an umbrella or an Apollo softbox. All right, moving on. Soft light. Soft light is a mystery for many novice speed lighters. Okay? Here's an example of hard light. See the shadows coming off of the stamens. Here's an example of soft light. The difference between those two images was created by, in this case of the soft light image, putting a translucent umbrella, a shoot through umbrella, between the flash and the flowers. So hard light and soft light. Here's really how I want you to think about it. It's not the light, it's the shadows. So you should really think, oh, hard shadows, soft shadows. Photographers think it's all about lighting. Let me suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's really all about shadowing. If you can get the shadowing done, you'll have great light. Okay? So here we have hard light and soft light. And the difference between those two, for the case of the soft light, is the placement of a diffusion panel behind the model. Okay? So what makes hard light? It's very simple. When the light source is smaller than the subject, the light comes at the subject from basically one direction. All right? And that one direction is what creates those shadows. The sun, in the case of the image on the left, sun is huge, but we're so far from it, it appears small in our sky. So the sun sends light from a very narrow set of angles, from basically one direction. It throws shadows. Clouds float in between the sun and us. The clouds become the light source, and all of a sudden the light's coming from over there, and over there, and over there, and over there. So the sunlight now comes through the clouds from lots of different angles. And the sunlight that's over there is throwing shadows over here, but those shadows are being filled by light coming in this way. So soft light is really about soft shadows, because what's happening is the light source increases in size, it sends the light at the subject from many different directions. So we want to think about how do we take a speed light, which is relatively small, unless you're photographing Barbie or a matchbox car, a speed light is going to be smaller than most things that you're going to light it with. So it inherently is going to create hard light. All right. So in, we basically can use some sort of modifier to make it appear bigger. We'll talk about those modifiers in just a moment, and then we're also going to talk about the idea of, oh, hey, maybe we can use a nearby wall to bounce light off of, because bounce flash off of a wall does something very similar. It sends the light at the subject from multiple directions that fills in the shadows. All right, so let's talk about modifiers for a moment. Again, diffusion panel there in the center. It doesn't matter whether it's a diffusion panel whether it's an umbrella, whether it's a soft box, OK? So there we go. A diffusion panel or a reflector panel. They can be rectangular, they can be square, they can be round, oval. The idea is you've got this flat surface. Most of them will collapse up in one way or the other. You can have umbrellas. And then you can have soft boxes. So let's take a look. My recommendation when you're starting out with off-camera flash, Get that three-foot ETTL cord and get yourself in the same time, at the same time, 
a five-in-one reflector kit. Get a 42-inch five-in-one reflector kit. Now what that five-in-one kit is, is basically a diffusion disc in the middle that has a zip-off cover. It's going to be, depending on the manufacturer, it's going to be white and gold and silver and black, basically. So the white and the silver and the gold you can use for reflection. Black you can use either as a quick, dark background. And so you can zip the cover on and off very, very quickly, all right? Now umbrellas. Umbrellas are a gateway drug to creating soft light. You got to experience umbrellas. But hopefully you won't finish your career as a photographer using umbrellas. Because umbrellas have this tendency to throw light in a really wide arc. And when you're working in small spaces and you want to light your subject but not the background, an umbrella can be hard. But you've got to experience umbrellas to begin with because they're affordable. And there's two broad types of umbrellas, as you can see on the slide. There's a reflective umbrella, where basically you're going to bounce that light from the speed light into the umbrella, and then it flies back towards the subject. And there's also shoot-through umbrellas. And in that case, that's what I use for those daylilies, the yellow flowers. I placed this translucent umbrella between the speed light and those flowers, and all of a sudden, the light source became this big from this big, and it set the light at the flowers from many different directions and filled those shadows. It softened those shadows. Now soft boxes. This is a favorite modifier of mine. It's called a quick box. All right. Comes in a range of sizes. I would recommend either the 15 inch or the 24. 24 being a little bit larger, of course, a little bit more versatile. But it folds up flat. Now a soft box, if you think about it, okay, well you got those diffuser discs. And that can be handy. They fold up. But it can be hard because there's no way to really connect the flash to the diffuser disc. A softbox solves that problem for you because generally it's going to have opaque sides, some way to mount a speed light, and then that translucent fabric. Softbox also has the advantage over umbrellas and over diffusion panels and reflectors because those opaque sides keep the light from spilling sideways. So I want you to experience the diffusion panel. I still carry them in my kit. Umbrellas really are in my kit so that I can teach with them because I find them maddening because they throw light everywhere. But soft boxes I'm a huge advocate of. And so the Impact Quick Box is a great one to start with. This is the kind of light that you can get out of an Impact Quick Box. Okay? Beautiful, soft light. Now the other soft boxes that I'm also a huge advocate of are the Apollo soft boxes by Westcott. Now the thing about the Apollos that's interesting is that they really are fancy umbrellas. They open and close just like an umbrella. They have a silver foil interior and then they have a ring of Velcro that you affix the, tr the diffusion panel to. All right. So with a Westcott Apollo soft box, you mount the speed light or speed lights on the inside. This is the orb. It's 42 inches across. It's an ab or 43 inches across. It's an absolute dream to light with. Very, very easy, even with a single speed light. But let's think about it. You got your speed light zipped up inside this Apollo orb. How are we going to control it? <coughs> if you got to change the power up and down, maybe it's not a big deal to pull the diffuser back, reach in, turn the power knob, close it up, and take another test shot. Maybe that's not a big deal. Or you put it on that extra long ETTL cord, and you can control the whole thing through the hot shoe in the back of your camera. Or if you've got the new generation of Canon speed lights with built-in radio, you don't need the cord. You just control the whole thing basically from the transmitter or another speed light in the hot shoe, and it goes right through the sidewall. But you need someone with the Apollos because you don't have direct access to that speed light. Whereas jumping back two frames, this guy is really easy to get to with the quick box. You can just run up to that soft box. There's the knob. You don't have to unzip anything, change any of your light modifiers. Okay, And there's an example of the light you can get out of an Apollo soft box. This is one soft box with one speed light. Beautiful, soft, soft light. So for events, I talked to you about the idea that when I'm running around by myself, I've got the short cord and one speed light in my hand, I'm doing this. I'm not shooting hard light. I'm putting this 8-inch soft box, I'm strapping it onto the head of my speed light. This is made by Lastalite, all right? And 
It's basically eight inches. It folds up flat, so it, it travels nicely. But it's really a great way when you're looking to minimize your kit or to do handheld off-camera soft light at events where you're running around, all right, that easy box by Lastalite. Okay, the eight inch version, not the bigger ones. If you want the bigger ones, get the quick boxes and keep the dollars in your wallet. All right, so there's an example. You can see literally right in the corner, that's that eight inch soft box and see how beautiful and soft that light is. All right, now pressing forward, pressing forward. This is again the quick start. We're moving quick. One of the things we also have to think about is you add light to your subject, but maybe you don't want to have that light fly past your subject onto the background. That's the reason that I don't really like a lot of umbrellas, OK? I want to light my subject, but I don't necessarily want to light my background. I'll use my shutter speed to make my background brighter or darker. All right? So look at the difference between these two shots. The one on the left has a shoot-through umbrella that, because it's just basically a giant hemisphere that's glowing with light, it's throwing light behind Sandra as much as it's throwing light onto Sandra. Okay? The image on the right was created by basically flagging. A flagging is a, fa a flagging is a fancy way of saying blocking the light. So in this case, I used a convertible shoot through umbrella. So let me take that apart for you. The shoot through part we have already covered. It's the translucent umbrella that sits between the light and your subject. Convertible, the idea the engineers had is, oh yeah, sometimes you want reflective, so you put the cover on and you bounce the light in and out. Sometimes you want shoot through and you take the cover off. Well, you can also take the cover off halfway. Use it as a shoot through. Use the translucent side towards your subject and the flagged half of the umbrella towards the background. So this is the setup I used to light Sandra. And the way that I kept that light flagged on the background, so you don't see that black piece of cardboard behind her. You don't see the seam in it. I'm not a Photoshopper. I'm, a, I'm not a retoucher. I'm a photographer. So I'm going to do it right before I push the shutter button. All right. So the difference between those two shots is I put the cover on one half of that shoot through umbrella. This umbrella, by the way, is 35 bucks. It's really, and it's 40 inches or so in diameter. It's really a nice way to start. Just be mindful of the fact that it's going to try to throw light everywhere. And if you've got your subject close to your background and you don't want to light the background, you're going to need to use that convertible cover as a flag. Now, another modifier, I'm cheating a little bit here because um, this is my, my young son, Tony. I'm not so young anymore. Um, but I'm lighting Tony and the background, obviously. But it was the best way that I had to show you that zoom, the zoom setting on your speed light, is basically a built-in modifier. Your speed light defaults to auto zoom. And the idea behind auto zoom is that as you change your lenses from wide to telephoto, the speed light repositions the flash tube so that instead of lighting this when you have a telephoto lens, it's going to match where it's lighting to what the camera sees. That's a way of saying, oh, these things are really powerful because you can throw a lot of light you know, 40 feet out. Yeah, when you're zoomed in really tight, you can. So this is the extreme range. With that little pull-out panel, you can throw light everywhere. And then down here, by zooming to 105 millimeters on my old 580EX2, I can create that dramatic slash of light. So I just want you to think about the fact that sometimes if you want to light your background, all right, and not your, excuse me, light your subject and not your background, you can zoom your speed light to a narrow zoom setting and then tip it on its side. Most often with portraits, we're lighting people who are standing up. So why should we try to have our speed light go this way when what we're really trying to do is light this? Okay? So you take that speed light, you tip it over, and you zoom it to its maximum setting, and then you're lighting the person and that light is not flying around them onto the background. You're zooming it manually, OK? If you've got a 430 or a 580, you're zooming to 105 <laughs> millimeters. If you've got the 600, you're zooming to 200 millimeters. There's that monoball swivel, all right? Lots of ways to get your speed light over on its side. 
orient your speed light so that it's basically the same angle as what you want it to light. Now there's another way to keep the light off the background and that's to flag the speed light. So what we've got here is one of my favorite modifiers. I carry three of these in my kit, basically one for every speed light in my kit. All right, the Rogue Flash Bender Large. There are other smaller flash benders. I don't like them. You've got to get the large one. It's 10 inches by 11 inches. And so you, it basically straps on. It's got three. The reason it's called the Flash Bender, it's got three aluminum wands in it. So we can do other things. I'll show you a couple of other things in a moment. But the idea behind this is I can strap it on the side of my speed light. If I just want my speed light to light this gentleman and not to light this gentleman, then I can create that big flag, which is why I use the large one. What else can you use? You can use your hand. You can MacGyver it with a piece of cardboard or tape or whatever. But think about the idea of saying, I'm going to block the light on one half or one side of my speed light, OK? All right. Now, there are modifiers that will limit the spread of the flash beyond the zoom setting on your speed light. The difference between these two shots is the fact that I used a grid on the frame in the left. All right? So that grid, here we go. Let's take a look at the set really quick. And you see in that upper corner there is the Strobro's grid kit. Okay. Now you'll see this online. It's going to say mini beauty reflector and grids. That's a real oxymoron because a beauty reflector needs to be big. So unless you're photographing Barbie, it's really not a mini beauty reflector. I call it a grid holder because that's how I use it. And it's a brilliant grid holder because in a literally two seconds, I can change from a big pattern grid, which makes a spotlight effect like this, to a medium sized grid, which is going to make a spotlight effect like that, to a really tiny spotlight effect with a really tight grid. And I can do it again in just a couple of seconds, which to me on a shoot makes a huge difference. Now Rogue makes a really ingenious grid set that is very durable, really small, compact. You can see you've got a range of lighting patterns. I'm a big fan of the Rogue products. But the reason I like the Strobros is to change the Rogue grid, you pull that plastic frame out, you push the grid out of the frame, and basically, depending on how you stack the two inserts, you either get wide, medium, or narrow pattern, and then you reassemble it and put it back in. It takes half a minute to a minute. I've lost my relationship with my subject unless I'm pre-lighting and I get all that work done. Now I'm taking a group to Cuba in April. This is going to be in my backpack and not the other one because it's much smaller. And I just have to, you know, we all trade off. It's like, what's most important to me? Well, if I have my lighting kit in a day pack, space and weight, but if I'm on a normal situation, it's going to be the Strobro's grid kit. Okay? So, and there again is that monoball swivel up in that upper corner. So grids, I'm a huge fanatic of grids in terms of my lighting style. Another way to control the spread of your flash is through what's called a snoot. So jumping back really quick, I've got direct flash on the left. And then I've got an 8-inch snoot on the right. Now, what's a snoot? A snoot is effectively a tube. So if I've got that rogue flash bender, there's the large on the top. There's the medium on the bottom. If I've got that rogue flash bender that I carry because I like the fact that I can create flags out of it really quickly, in a pinch, I can roll it and create a snoot. I can create a tube. Why would I want to do that if I could zoom? Well. Oftentimes, I need a tighter patch of light than I can zoom. If I've got grids, I'm going to reach for the grids and not for a snoot, because grids are more precise than snoots. But if what I'm doing is traveling light, and I've got one speed light and one flash bender, because it's my Swiss Army knife modifier, then I'm going to roll a snoot out of that grid or out of that flash bender and run down the path. Studio shooters like snoots that are made of metal. Okay. So if you do a lot of studio work, a lot of product or food photography, and you want to create from your speed light a dollar size, a silver dollar size patch of light to light the face of a watch, then a metal snoot like that is going to be your weapon of choice. OK? OK. So I'm going to leave some time for questions. But I want to run you through a handful of scenarios for lighting with one speed light. We're going to talk about the fundamentals of Canon's off-camera flash. Then if we have any time left, we'll talk about two lighting setups. The good news is you have all of these diagrams in your books. All right? 
So in terms of creating soft light with one speed light, when you're running and gunning, you can, from your hot shoe, turn the head of your speed light to a wall or to a ceiling, OK? And you're basically increasing the apparent size of that light. You're sending light at your subject from many different directions, creating those softer shadows. So here again is Diallo, good-natured sport that he was. And I fired the speed light from the hot shoe straight at him. Not a bad shot if you need a passport photo, but not a great shot, OK? So here I angled the light off the nearby wall. And I just had him look at the wall just a little bit. And there's a lot more depth. We pick up that rim light, that highlight on his cheekbone, all right? And just for the point of comparison, I bounced it off of the ceiling. I don't like ceiling bounce. I'll avoid it at all costs, all right? Why? Because many people, myself included, have deeper eye sockets. So we get that raccoon effect. You bounce it off the ceiling, you light my face, so you're not putting any light in my eyes. So if you've got to go for a ceiling bounce, use that rogue flash bender and you can curve the wands and it's going to throw most of the light up but some of the light forward into the eye sockets or in a pinch if there's no wall no rogue flash bender you got a macgyver put your hand up there do something to throw some light forward by the way that little pull out panel that you've seen with your speed light good up to a meter and a half let's do the math that's four and a quarter feet canon came clean in the manual for the 600 exrt good up to a meter and a half so you're not going to do a ceiling bounce off that little white panel. I write, if found, drop it in the email box, postage guarantees, Silarina, Paso Robles, California. OK, so wall bounce is the way to run if you've got a run and gun. Now here's another tip. When you're shooting off-camera flash, particularly when you're photographing women, point the speed light at their nose. If you point the speed light at their nose, they have a very small nose shadow. I know we're about creating shadows to create shape and depth and texture. But we don't need a big old snoz shadow going across the cheek, which is what happens when the bride is looking this way and you put your flash over here. All of a sudden, she's got this huge nose shadow across her cheek. So one speed light lighting somebody, you'll be amazed. Hard light angled right at the nose. The way the camera sees it, it's not soft, but it doesn't look ugly like hard light often does. So point that one speed light at their nose. If you've got a five-in-one reflector kit, you can take out that disc, put on the silver side, and bounce the speed light off of that and create soft light. If you want more even light across the front of your subject, have the reflector in close to your camera. If you want really dramatic shadows, then you push that reflector out away from the camera. Same thing with umbrellas, shoot through or reflective. The closer the camera, the more they're going to reach around your subject's face and you'll have nice, even, soft lighting. The farther out on that lighting compass it goes, the more dramatic those shadows are going to become. So just experiment with, again, 45 degrees, halfway between here and there is a good starting point. Another thing you can do with a single speed light, your outdoors sunlight. Now, you can't control where the sun is, but you can control, perhaps, the angle that your subject is facing and where you put the camera, certainly. So you can think about using this sun as a key light off 45 degrees, and then use the speed light symmetrically coming in from the other side as fill flash. OK, so again, that concept of key light and fill light. Another thing you can do, I love these bounce shots. You can fly most of the flash in front of your subject camera's not going to see light flying in front of me. Some of the light's going to hit me. That light that flies in front of me, you capture with a reflector disc, and you bounce it back in. So with a single flash, I can have key light coming in here and fill light coming in here. Just one flash, but the trick is it's called feathering. You just have to pan that light so that most of it flies in front of me, and then you've got a device over here to capture it and send it back in. So those are just some quick tips in terms of the things that we can do with one speed light. All right, looking at my watch, running around the, the final corner here. Fundamentals of Canon's wireless flash system. 
We basically have two types of wireless flash these days. Since March of this year, we've had radio and optical. For many, many years, we've had optical. So that's where we're going to begin. Canon's built-in wireless flash system, which again is my choice. It's what I use professionally on location, all right? It's built upon the flash tube in either the pop-up of your camera, if you have one of the compatible cameras that can be a master. It's built into the 550, the 580EX, and the 600EX flash tube, all right? And this optical system is using an ultra-fast series of light pulses, think of it like Morse code, sending the instructions to the slaves. Now it's really important to know where the slave eye is on your speed light. And on Canon speed lights, it's that black panel on the front of our speed light. It's not the big red one. That's the marketing department's idea of what the autofocus assist light should look like. Bigger is better, apparently, when it comes to red pieces of plastic. The slave eye is in that little black panel in the front. All right? That's important to remember, because if the slave cannot see the master, it's not going to fire. Put your hand over the front of that slave, or put your hand over the master's flash tube, and you're shutting down that whole system. Now, the reason that people think that this built-in system isn't reliable is they didn't understand this trick. I live in California, sun-drenched part of the world. I shoot in the middle of the day routinely with the built-in system. You have to turn the body of the slave so that the eye is facing the master. In this shot, a little quickie snapshot portrait session I did with my son Tony several years ago, late afternoon sun, I turned the master on the camera. I turned its head so it was pointed to the slave. And I turn the body of the slave so that the front of the slave is facing the master. And then I turn the head so that it was facing my subject. You understand that you should do that to every one of your slaves, and you will find that this is a very reliable, robust system. People just don't understand, A, where is that eye in the first place? And B, it's perfectly OK to twist the body. You can be a contortionist. All right, to your slave speed light so that you get that geometry right. Now, there are some times where the geometry just does not work. And that's why I continue to carry that extra long ETTL cord in my kit. Because there are times outdoors where having the slaves look at the master means they're looking right at the fiery orb behind me, mainly the sun. They're looking right in the sun. They're going to be blinded. So the trick then is really simple. Take your master off camera on an ETTL cord and turn the bodies of the slaves away from the sun and put that master in a spot where the slaves are going to see it. Because it's that ETTL cord, I'm still controlling the whole system from the back of my camera. So you don't have to have the master in the hot shoe of your camera. It just has to be connected to the hot shoe of your camera. And you can put it in a spot where the slave eyes will see it. Now radio. This is new, as I say, with March of this year with Canon's introduction of the 600EX RT speed light. Now the cool thing about radio is that that signal goes out everywhere. It's kind of like my hair. It's just going every direction. All right. So we've got the little STE3 RT transmitter down on the bottom. And we've got the 600EX RT, which can be a master over there. And they're going to send that signal everywhere. I don't have to worry about the geometry. I don't have to worry about the sun blinding the slave. But there's only right now in Canon system one radio slave, and that's the 600EXRT. So the, and that system, that Speedlight 600EXRT, can work in radio or it can work in optical. So if you've got a 600EXRT, it's going to play very nicely with your 580s and your 430s. But notice the big OR. We don't get radio and optical at the same time. You can't take a 600EX and put it into an Apollo softbox with a bunch of 580s and somehow communicate to the 600 and have it translate that to the 580s. That does not exist. Because 580s only speak optical. They need to see the flash pulses. Okay, So in that case, I run the cord over inside the softbox, put the master on, and the 580s are perfectly happy to work with the 600 in optical. So the 600 can go either way, but not both ways at the same time. So again, that 600 can work as a solo speed light, a radio master, radio slave, optical master, optical slave. 
the SDE3 RT does one job, it's a radio master only. Now the cool thing about the little transmitter, it is an exact replica of the back of the 600 EXRT. So you learn how to run the speed light, and then you want to get into off camera, you can get the transmitter instead of a cord if you want, if your wallet allows for it, and you already know how to work the transmitter because it's just like working the speed light except that there's no flash tube. So same thing applies though, if you've got two 600s and you want to put both into action as off-camera flashes, you don't want to have that one in the hot shoe just as a transmitter, you can move a radio speed light off on an ETTL cord. You just have to be sure that it's an ETTL cord, okay? All right, very quickly on the new system, you activate the wireless system by pushing the sideways flash bolt. And that's going to cycle you through from non-wireless to radio master to radio slave, then into optical master, optical slave, and then back to the top, non-wireless. Your 580 EX2, your 430 EX2, if you haven't found this out, that sideways flash bolt, Canon's wireless flash system is hidden behind the zoom button. On your 580 EX2, your 430 EX2, you press and you hold the zoom button for three seconds and then you're going to see the word off flashing on the screen. And you turn the dial, and it's going to say master on. You turn it one more click, it'll say slave on. So that's how with your 580 EX2 and your 430 EX2, you get in and out of the wireless system. It's hidden, effectively. On the original generation of the 580 and the 430, we had that little lever in the bottom. Okay, But that little lever can't be weatherproofed, which is what the EX2 generation was largely about. There are lots of concepts about wireless flash. Here's one that is so, so important to understand. This concept of whether a master is enabled or disabled. All right? Enabled means this. The master sends the instructions to the slaves through the Morse code pre-flash or the radio signal. And then when the shutters open, it also <laughs> fires as a flash. All right? Disabled does not mean that it's not a master. It means that it sends the instructions to the slaves, and then when the shutter opens, it doesn't fire any more light. So if you've got your master in the hot shoe of your camera, because of its position, it's going to throw on-camera flash into your shot. If you don't want on-camera flash, then you probably want to disable that master speed light. All right? So that's, there's lots of things to understand. Um, about the wireless system, I want you guys to save your brain cells, okay? You can do all of these things on the LCD of the speed light, but the icons, this is the difference between master enabled and disabled right there, but those icons are about a quarter of an inch high, if that. On the back of your camera, it puts it up in the language that you speak and the language you read. So try to do the wireless system, if you can, via the LCD of your camera and you'll actually enjoy it a whole lot more. There is so much more to talk about in terms of wireless techniques. Speedlighter's handbook has several chapters devoted and it shows you the screenshots of buttons and dials. So I've spent, and you can go to the B&H YouTube channel and look at previous presentations that I did last year where we talked exclusively about the wireless system. All right, we're gonna close out with kind of a sprint for like three minutes and then we'll answer some questions really quick. Um, but we're, we're going to close out with some ideas for using two and three and four speed lights. All right? So the fundamental thing, again, think about key and fill light, the main light and then some additional light into the shadow areas. If you've got two speed lights, you can literally stand in a dark warehouse and create those two speed lights. Notice in a lot of these diagrams it says enabled master. Just as a reminder to say, hey, you don't have to have three speed lights to get the wireless system to work. You can take your master off camera. This is, frankly, my favorite lighting setup in the world. Two speed lights, fire them straight at each other. Put your subject in the middle. Then work as the photographer in an arc between the two speed lights. All right, you will find many different striking styles of light in that simple formula. Two speed lights firing right at each other, <coughs> your subject in the middle. You can fire at hard light. You can fire soft light out of one, hard light out of the other, soft light out of both. Lots of different ways to go. We'll get to questions just a sec. 
All right? You got another sp option. You can bounce your master off of a wall as soft fill light. And then your slave can be firing right at your subject as a key light. OK? We can go in lots and lots of different directions. Here's one I want to show you really quick. We often think about key and fill being a horizontal relationship. You can also stack them vertically and have your key light above going through a soft box or an umbrella. This is called clamshell lighting. It's an old Hollywood lighting style. And then have your second speed light come down below. If you want to create glamour lighting on headshots, look up clamshell lighting or over under. This is the lighting diagram that we saw earlier where I had key and fill in front of the subject and a hair light behind. All right, group shots. And this, I think, will be where we're going to end the diagrams. The key to lighting groups, if you can, is to have symmetrical lighting all right, around your group. And contrary to popular opinion, okay, you don't necessarily want those lights thrown in really close on your group. Pull them back farther. Now, if you've got a way to put a speed light behind your group, do that as well, because that's going to create a little bit of hair light and a little bit of separation light. Okay? So I've done a number of nice family group style portraits with 20 people at reunions and such, with just two or three speed lights and a couple of umbrellas. All right? So let's just jump forward. There's my contact info again. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions until b &H kicks us out. I want to thank everyone, though, for coming today. Um, it's always a joy to be here at b &H. And also, again, a big shout out to Canon, because they are the ones that made it possible for me to be here today. All right, so questions. We got. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.